here I am at the Ice Cube Laboratory, which is part of the larger Ice Cube Neutrino Detector, which is the biggest, most expensive experiment here at the South Pole and one of the largest in the world. If you're thinking that there is no way this little building could be a world-class physics experiment, I wouldn't blame you. But looks are deceiving. The real magic of Ice Cube isn't in this building. It's deep in the ice of Antarctica. Here, deep in the ice below the South Pole Station, you'll find the workhorse of the Ice Cube Observatory, the Digital Optical Module, or DOM. The DOM is an advanced sensor designed to detect effects of neutrinos in the ice. The DOM is constructed of many different parts. There's the glass pressure sphere that protects the DOM from the crushing pressure of the ice, and the pressure band that holds the two halves of the sphere together. There's the photomultiplier, which is basically a light sensor that is really, really sensitive, which is important for detecting neutrinos. Then there's what's called the mu metal cage, which helps cut down interference with the sensor. There's the main circuit board, and then there's the flasher board, which has light on it so that DOMs can signal each other within the ice and help calibrate the experiment. This function is pretty important because there are over 5,000 of these DOMs deep within the ice that all need to be coordinated and calibrated. All the DOMs are strung together on a cable, and the first DOM is at a depth of 1,450 meters, or nearly a mile deep. The deepest one is at 2,450 meters, or one and a half miles deep. Each string of DOMs is taller than the Burj Khalifa, and the entire array encompasses about a cubic kilometer of ice, hence the name Ice Cube. Okay, so what are neutrinos, where do they come from, and how does Ice Cube detect them? To put it in very simple terms, a neutrino is a fundamental physical particle, like an electron or a photon. It travels very fast, at nearly the speed of light, and it almost never interacts with normal matter. The vast majority of the time, neutrinos just pass right through matter without leaving a trace. In fact, right now there are trillions of neutrinos passing through your body every second, but you can't feel them. This last quality is what makes neutrinos so difficult to study. If a particle almost never interacts with matter, then you need a very large amount of matter to give you the best chance of detecting it. Also, on the rare occasion that a neutrino does interact with matter, the reaction produces light. So you need the matter in your detector to be very, very clear, because if you can't see the light, you can't detect the neutrino. That's why Ice Cube is designed the way it is. Thousands of detectors in a large amount of very clear ice in a dark place. So where do neutrinos come from? They can come from a number of sources, like the sun and nuclear reactors, but what Ice Cube is looking for is something special. It's looking for high-energy neutrinos that come from outside our solar system, and I'm going to tell you the story of one that turned out to be kind of important for astronomy. Like so many great stories, we have to start a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But not this galaxy. This one's too nice. I'm looking for a fuzzier one. Here we go. This is the galaxy TXS 0506, and although you've probably never heard of it, it holds one of the most powerful objects in the universe. A blazar. Blazars are basically supermassive black holes that gobble up matter around them, and in turn start spewing out high-energy particles, like neutrinos, in powerful jets. So this blazar TXS 0506 gobbles up a star or something and spews out all these high-energy neutrinos. Now the unique thing about blazars compared to other supermassive black holes is that their jet of particles is pointed right at our solar system. So our neutrino speeds off from the blazar and heads toward Earth at almost the speed of light, but even so, it still takes a few billion years to get here. Finally, in September 2017, the neutrino passes through the Earth and into the ice of Ice Cube's detector field. And, lucky for us, it decides to smash into a hydrogen atom there, resulting in a shower of light within the ice. Within seconds, the Ice Cube computers were able to create a model of its path through the ice and get an idea of where it came from. This triggered an automatic alert sent out to telescopes around the world to look at that area of the sky, and when they did, they saw a burst of radiation from the blazar, which basically confirmed that that's where the neutrino came from. This whole event was important for two reasons. For one, it was the first time scientists could say with some confidence that we had found the birthplace of a high-energy neutrino. 
and two, it was one of the earliest demonstrations of what's called multi-messenger astronomy, which just means taking two very different experiments, like a neutrino detector and a conventional telescope, and using them together to study the stars. But let's get back to the laboratory. Because there are over 5,000 optical sensors running 24-7, IceCube is constantly generating a massive amount of data, and that data needs to be processed and refined before being sent back to the primary host of the project, the University of Wisconsin. That refinement process is the main function of the building, which is called the IceCube Laboratory. So when you first walk into the Ice Cube Laboratory, it actually looks kind of unassuming, despite it being one of the biggest physics experiments in the world. This first room is just a workshop for building maintenance, etc. But through here is where we have the electronics workshop, where the scientists can do small repairs to the electronics if they need to. And then here we have an example of one of the many, many sensors that are down in the ice. All the data they're collecting goes upward through this cable and upstairs to the server room, which I'll show you right now. You might have seen the snacks I was standing next to, and those are there because you never know when you're going to get hit with bad weather. There's also a bed in the building for the same reason. All right, so I've come up to the server anteroom, which has all the readouts of all the data that are coming in. Um, also all the sensors that monitor the temperature in the server room. And then this screen right here tells them the status of, of all the sensors in the ice. And then through here is the server room, but first I gotta get an anti-static jacket on. Okay, so this is the server room. This is probably one of the biggest power draws on station because all these computers are going all the time, getting all the data up from the sensors, filtering it, refining it. As you can see, tons of server racks here. This whole entire row going all the way down is just all servers. And if you look above me, there's actually these giant cables coming in from each side of the building. And these are cables coming in from the sensors feeding all that data upwards. So if you can see how big and thick these cables are, there's two layers of them, and they're coming in from two different sides. So a ton of data. The first time I walked through here, I was just overwhelmed by the just terabytes of data that are just flowing around me all the time. A couple other unique things about the Ice Cube server room. It's actually the only actively cooled room on the entire South Pole Station complex. Every other room is actively heated. It also uses an FE13 fire suppression system to protect the electronics, so if you hear the alarms go off, it's probably smart to leave as quickly as possible. Besides being a world-class experiment, IceCube is also one of the furthest buildings away from the main elevated station, so it's nice to go up on the roof on a nice sunny day and take in the views of the plateau. That's all for Ice Cube. Remember to like and subscribe if you want to see me make more of these videos, and keep an eye on my channel for the next video where I tell you all about the South Pole Telescope.